Hello, I'm Jay Miller, an engineer at Digidata. In this video, I'm going to be introducing you to User Collections, a new construct in version 5.1 of our core. User Collections are helpful in logically grouping users for the purposes of administration and collaboration. A user may be either a member of a user collection, an administrator of a user collection, or both. Additionally, users may have these relationships to multiple collections. Let's look at a quick example. Here is a simple org chart showing a small company with some executives and two departments. Let's suppose that the VPs, Jennifer and Rick, have decided that each department should have its own collaborative storage. To accomplish this, they each create a new user collection and add the workers in their respective departments as members. Once these collections are set up, Jennifer and Rick can each create shared spaces for their departments to use as they see fit. Beyond the departmental spaces, this company may also need a shared space that is restricted to only executives. In this case, Alice could create a third user collection containing only the three executives and a corresponding shared space. Finally, it's also probably true that everyone in the company resides in a global user collection that might be used for company-wide sharing or just to allow everyone access to a list of all employees. Now that you have a rough understanding of the purpose of user collections, let's jump into a demo showing how they work on a more technical level. This demo centers on a hypothetical company called SmartCo and its two distinct business models. One of its models involves selling its services to individual end users. The end users have no relationship to one another but may want to create small groups of their own to, say, manage their family's access to the service. The other model is designed for small businesses. As in the example earlier, SmartCo offers small businesses the ability to securely divide their service among departments and help workers collaborate with one another. When SmartCo first gains access to their new Digidata online storage, their administrator will have access to the service through a single user account called admin at SmartCo and administrative permissions to a single user collection called SmartCo. To begin with, let's look at this user and her collection through the Digidata REST service. This is a rudimentary HTML application built on top of the Digidata REST service that allows us to browse the data model in a relatively straightforward manner. Here we see the admin at SmartCo accounts metadata, associations to other resources in the service, and near the bottom, a set of related entity collections. Clicking on Memberships will reveal that this user is an admin of the SmartCo user collection. Let's make our first task as the SmartCo admin to be that of creating a new user collection for their individual customers. To do this, we're going to brave the command line with a rather recondite console application that also interacts with the Digidata REST service. Since we're going to be using this tool numerous times in this demo, I'm going to try to give an intelligible overview of how it works by way of example. Here's our first command line. Before executing it, let's examine each argument. This first pair specifies the user for whom the command is to be executed. In this case, we're logging in as admin at SmartCo. This cryptic argument just tells the tool that we're going to be dealing in raw XML and that it shouldn't bother to make things pretty for us. The M argument specifies the HTTP method that should ultimately be used in the request to the service. In the Digidata REST service, POST is often used for entity creation. Here we're passing in a file as input. The contents of this file will be placed in the body of the request. Finally, the last argument is a rather complex query that ultimately identifies a resource on the system. We can ignore the specifics of that query, but let's not ignore the content of that XML file. The details of this XML format are available in our documentation. For now, however, there are two important parts. First, that we're sending an entity of type user collection, and second, that it has the name customers. All of the XML files used in the course of this demo will look similar to this one. Since we've seen the XML input and gone over the command line arguments, we're now in a position to make a broad statement about what this command does. As the admin at SmartCo user, we're going to create a new resource with post of an XML file describing a user collection called customers to the SmartCo user collection. Let's give it a try. The output of this command happens to be the response body from the service. What we see here is more XML representing the newly created user collection resource on the server. 
Notably, it now has a unique ID field with which we can identify it later, and it also has the name we provided in the input file. Now that we've been introduced to the tools, let's move ahead with the demo by creating users for our two paying customers. Instead of parsing this XML, let's swap back to the slightly more appealing HTML interface. First, let's see if we can find the customer's user collection. There it is. Happily, its ID field matches what we saw earlier in the XML output from the command line interface. If we bring up the page for the user collection itself and view its members, here we can see the two new users we created for our customers. Note that we're still logged in as the SmartCo administrator and can therefore see both users. Let's venture back to the command line and run a quick query to make sure the users themselves can't see other users. This command is a little simpler than the others we've seen so far. Note in particular that the dash RC is now missing, which tells the application that we want pleasant, human-readable output. It does still have the user credentials, this time corresponding to the first customer we created earlier. Finally, looking at the query, we want to retrieve the members of the customer's user collection. Human readable indeed. But at least it's better than XML. In any case, it is possible to see that from Claire's point of view, the customer's collection only has a single member, namely herself. The final administrative task we need to accomplish is configuring the customer's user collection, so the system knows that these new members do not have the same administrative privileges of admin at SmartCo. To do this, we're going to add a well-known tag to the newly created user collection. User collection configuration is fully explained in the documentation, so we won't dwell on the specifics. However, we will get a chance to see the impact of this configuration a little later. At this point, we have two user collections in the SmartCo system and a total of three users. In earlier versions of the Digidata Core, we were limited to a user organization structure roughly equivalent to this one. But let's take this new system further by supposing that Claire wants to divvy up her storage for her family. Like all users, she is allowed to create user collections of her own. So, let's execute a couple of commands while logged in as Claire to create a new user collection called Family, and let's make her a member of that new collection since she is a part of her own family. We're not going to focus on these commands because they're nearly identical to those we saw when we created the customer's user collection before. Now we're going to hop back to the HTML application to view this new user collection while logged in as Claire. you can see that Claire is currently the lone member and that she is also an admin of this collection. Be careful here to note Claire's quota. When she was created by the SmartCo admin, she was allotted about 100k of storage. According to the way we configured the customer's user collection a moment ago, Claire must allot storage to her family members from her own quota. Let's see this in action as Claire creates new users for her husband and son. Here's the husband. Now back to the HTML view, where we refresh the page and re-examine the members of the family user collection. Clifford now appears in the collection, but note the new value for Claire's quota. Instead of a 100k quota, she now only has about 85k. That extra 15k was handed over entirely to Clifford for his own personal space. Now let's have Claire create a user for her son and head back again to the HTML view, and finally back to the list of members. There are now three users in the family user collection, and note that Claire's quota has decreased yet again when she allotted 15 additional K to Theo. On the plus side, however, each member of Claire's family is now a bona fide user in the SmartCo system, and our user collection structure is looking a little more interesting. An alternative to allotting quotas as Claire did is to create shared spaces, which allow members of a user collection to share the same quota. We will see this demonstrated in the final portion of this video when we examine SmartCo's small business model. We're going to start off in the same way as before, by creating a new user collection. 
This one will be called Small Business. Instead of the SmartCo administrator creating all of the small business's employees, however, the SmartCo admin is just going to create a single member in this new collection and delegate administration of the small business service to her. With the creation of this admin account, the SmartCo admin no longer has any responsibility toward the small business user collection. Now, when we create a small business employee, we can do so as the small business admin. We now have two members in the small business user collection. Unlike the previous business model, however, the small business employees are not independent of one another. In fact, they want to be able to interact with other members. To that end, we're going to configure the small business user collection to allow its members to view other members' account metadata by enabling the peer visibility configuration parameter. When we execute a request, similar to the one we saw before from Claire, we find that Bob, the employee, can also see Alice, his coworker. To conclude our small business demo, let's look at shared spaces. To belabor the obvious a bit, shared spaces allow administrators of user collections to define folders that are shared directly with those user collections. These folders become collaborative spaces, in the context of which the actions of any member of the user collection are immediately available to all other members. Additionally, members who are added to the user collection after the fact automatically gain access to the shared content. To spice up the visuals a bit, we'll create a shared space on Alice's account using Vault Explorer, a tool that offers access to the service through a Windows shell extension. Here I'm giving Vault Explorer Alice's credentials. To make a shared space, Alice just needs to start with a simple folder. To keep things easy, she'll only upload a single PDF into the newly created space. With that file and folder on Alice's account, she's now able to convert that folder into a shared space by posting a share entity to the REST service. The response is pretty dense XML, but we ought to be able to pull a couple of notable tidbits out of it if we scroll up to view a bit more of its content. To start with, note that the shared item is a folder, and that the name of this folder is the same as the one Alice just created on her account. Moving just below the folder representation, we see that the recipient of the share, identified with the shared with relation, is an actual user collection. In this case, as expected, we've created a shared space for the small business user collection. To demonstrate access to this shared space, let's switch back to the HTML application. Since accessing the shared space as Alice, its creator, wouldn't be very interesting, we'll log in as Bob, the other member of the small business user collection. Beginning at the representation of Bob's user, we can navigate to the collection of shares he has received from others, and then to the specific share entity whose XML we just examined. As we saw in the XML, the shared space was referenced with the shared item relation, which is available at the top of the page. Again, we see the folder that Alice created, but we want the PDF that is stored among the folder's children. Clicking the file identifier actually retrieves the file's metadata. If we want to download the actual file, which we do, we'll need to navigate to its data relation. Here, finally, is the PDF that Alice uploaded to her shared space, now fully accessible by Bob. That brings our user collection demonstration to a close, and I thought I would finish with the briefest of looks at the REST documentation, which is always available from the home page of the REST service via the doc relation. In here, one can find each of the concepts we've visited in this video in all of their dry technical glory. The first sections contain details about the Digidata REST service media type and protocol. The command line program we use throughout the demo and its complicated queries are discussed in CLI querying of the Digidata REST service. And finally, a detailed page on user administration that walks through tasks such as user creation and user collection configuration. That's it for our video. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching.